Well, we're in the book of Psalms in what's the, the fifth of five books. In fact, we're going to undertake close to the end tonight, Psalm 135 through 144. And uh, that will leave just a few, a half a dozen actually, for uh, next time, which we, in which we will finish our review of the book. But uh, uh, we're going to start, of course, with Psalm 135. We're going to praise the Lord for an interesting thing, for who he is, for who he is. We've just finished the pilgrim psalms, the 15 songs of ascents as they traveled on those three compulsory feasts every year, every able-bodied Judas family pilgrimage to uh, Jerusalem and the 15 songs of ascent were our uh, subject last time. This psalm is sort of a parenthesis of hallelujahs. It begins with praise the Lord, in fact, four times, and ends with bless the Lord four times. In fact, hallelujah itself is repeated, I think, eight times in the psalm. And in this, Israel praises God for many of his achievements on their behalf in the past. So let's just jump in. Psalm 135, verse 1. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the name of the Lord. Praise him, O ye servants of the Lord. Remember, these were songs. We don't have the music, but these were, these were intended to be sung. So it's a, very speci- it's a poem, but a very special kind. Ye that stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God, praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises unto his name, for it is pleasant. For the Lord hath chosen Jacob unto himself, and Israel for his peculiar treasure. Indeed he did, but why? Why did he pick Israel? Israel's a chosen people. He picked them, gave them some very interesting distinctives, not the least of which is he he dwelt among them. He entrusted them with his word. No other nation on the planet Earth can make that claim or anything even coming close to that. Well, why Israel? Well, probably the only real answer is in verse 3. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. He was good to them. That was his choice, and he's in charge. He can do what he likes. Continuing, for I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. We're going to find from verses 15 on that the the so-called gods can't do anything. And uh, the Yodhe Vavhe, or the Father God, can do anything he wants. Well, almost anything he wants. There are some things God can't do. Did you know that? Did you know that? There's some things he can't do. He can't learn. I like that one. Because if he can't learn, he can't be disappointed in me. I might be disappointed in my behavior. He's not surprised. He knows all things from the beginning. And he, and he loves me anyway. That's amazing. The other thing God can't, there's not something else he cannot do. He cannot lie. Eight times in the scripture, the eternal one cannot lie. So he can't redo anything. The Muslims claim Allah can do anything. In fact, he's he's presented as being capricious. You never know what he's going to do for sure. Read that untrustworthy. The God of Avram, Isaac, and Yaakov delights in making and keeping his promises. Continuing verse 6, whatsoever... The Lord pleased that did he in heaven and in earth, in the seas, and all deep places. And I have no idea what that might mean, but your conjecture is as good as mine. The Busso, I guess. There's, there's regions down there that we know little of. He causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings for the rain. He bringeth the wind out of his treasuries. See, it's God that makes the weather. He runs the universe as he, sees, as he sees fit. That also means he doesn't have to answer our questions. He just asks us to trust him and live a life of faith. Then it goes on about some of the history here. He smote the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast. You know, it's amazing how often in the scripture, God makes reference to the exodus of Egypt as one of his great achievements. God does many great things. And we could go on and on and list them. But it's fascinating to me how often he points to that particular issue 
as a source of, of pride, if I can put it that way. Smote the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast, who sent tokens and wonders into the midst of thee, O Egypt, upon Pharaoh and upon all his servants, who smote great nations and slew mighty kings, Sihon, the king of the Amorites, and Og, the king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan. We're going to hear more of those before the evening's over. And gave their land for an heritage, and a heritage unto Israel, his people. Thy name, O Lord, endureth forever, and thy memorial, O Lord, throughout all generations. For the Lord will judge his people, and he will repent himself concerning his servants. It's interesting how the psalmist here is comparing the living God with idols. You know, uh, it, was, it was interesting to realize that there was a time that the great God Ra, R-A, Ra, had shrines covering many, many acres. And today, it's just a filler for crossword puzzles. That's really all it amounts to, isn't it? Interesting. For the Lord will judge his people and he will repent himself. You know, it's interesting. You have to take a course in comparative religions in a university or someplace to learn the names of all these false gods. You won't learn them any other way. But no one has to go anywhere and not be confronted with the, the name of the living God in one form or another. Yod Vave or the Messiah of Israel, whatever. Continuing about these idols, I love this passage. It's actually a quote from Psalm 115. We touched on it before. But it's almost a lift from that. The idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouths. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. Well, on the one hand, of course, this is one of the, you know, as you try to hide the humor of the whole thing, there's several places in the scripture where it describes how they go out and cut out a tree and then carve on it and bow down before it as a god. It's, you know, it, it's, it is pretty ridiculous. But there's just no way to summarize the insanity of paganism and the cost to humanity over the centuries. But there is a verse here I want you to really remember, and that's verse 18. They that make them are like unto them, so is everyone that trusteth in them. The fundamental truth that shows up several times in the scripture, but it's very profound, is that we become like the things we worship. Is the world materialistic? Is the world cold and unforgiving? If you worship the world, you'll become like what you worship. You'll become materialistic, cold, and unforgiven. You can put anything in that blank you like. Whatever you're worshiping, that's what you will be ultimately become like. That's one of the most fundamental reasons why it's important to make sure you're worshiping Jesus Christ. Because that's who you want to become like. They that make them are like unto them, so is everyone that trusteth in them. That's on the idol side. Bless the Lord, O house of Israel. Bless the Lord, O house of Aaron. Bless the Lord, O house of Levi. Ye that fear the Lord, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord out of Zion, which dwelleth at Jerusalem. Bless, bless ye the Lord. See, Israel could praise the Lord because he dwelt among them. No other nation can make that statement. And uh, he is going to rule the planet Earth once again out of Israel, out of Zion. That's the strange destiny. Aaron and, and uh, Levi being mentioned because, of course, the focus of the, the singing here was the priests in the temple. Okay, the next psalm is probably very familiar to you, although you may not remember the number 136, but I encourage you to try to remember that number because this psalm is... is uh, very direct. It's sometimes called the great halal or the great hallelujah. Every verse has the same refrain. 
for his mercy endureth forever. It was designed to be sung probably antiphonally, if you will, with the leader singing the one part and then everybody else echoing the, the refrain. And uh, it's an antiphonal psalm, we believe. This psalm will turn history into theology and turn the theology into worship. It was sung at the dedication of Solomon's temple, and it was sung by King Jehoshaphat's uh, singers when Judah was attacked by Moab and Ammon, and probably on many other occasions in their history. Psalm 136. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. And, and you say? Well, I did, I did, let me hear it a little more clearly. There we go. Oh, give thanks unto the God of gods. You're getting it. This is good. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords. To him who alone doeth great wonders. To him that by wisdom made the heavens. To him that stretcheth out the earth above the waters. You know, it's interesting that we have here so far an emphasis on him as creator. He does these great wonders. He made, made by wisdom. What was the first thing that was ever created? Do you know? Good for you. Someone did their homework. Wisdom is exactly it. Proverbs 8. Very good. You get a star. That's well done. Well done. And uh, that by wisdom made the heavens, that stretches out the earth above the waters. Did you know that there is a specific judgment pronounced upon any culture, upon any nation, that fails to acknowledge him as a creator. And I, it shocked me to discover this. It's something I thought I knew many years ago, but I never realized it was a judgment of God. And that if you read Romans chapter 1, verse 20, and to the end of that chapter, it points out that for those cultures that fail to acknowledge him as a creator, God will give them over to this particular judgment. That judgment is homosexuality. I've always looked at that as an individual choice thing, and, and indeed it is, don't misunderstand me. But also, as a culture, that's a blight that is a harbinger of the eventual collapse of that culture. That's true in history, and it's true in our day. How interesting. Well, let's continue. Verse, at verse 7, to him that made great lights, the sun to rule by day, the moon and stars to rule by night. To him that smote Egypt in their firstborn. And brought out Israel from among them. With a strong hand and with a stretched out arm. To him which divided the Red Sea into parts. This is obviously referring to the Exodus, which is Israel's birthday. They went down to Israel as a family of 70. They came out as a nation. Israel's birthday is, is specifically described that way in Exodus chapter 4. It's the, the birth of the nation as a nation. Let's continue. And he made Israel to pass through the midst of it. And overthrew Pharaoh and his hosts in the Red Sea. To him which led his people through the wilderness. You know, as we sing this, and I'm sorry to keep pausing here, but there's some other thoughts to reinforce what's going on here. Moses commanded them to remember the wilderness years because they're going to, from after their exodus, they're going to wander in the wilderness. They are to remember those wilderness years. Those were years that were unnecessary. Those were years that came about because of their lack of faith at Kadesh Barnea. And for that lack of faith, they were condemned, so to speak, to for 38 years, call it 40, 40 years, to wander in the wilderness. It was a time of failure. And again and again and again, they, they failed. And uh, in Deuteronomy 8, uh, uh, Moses emphasizes all of that. But the reason I emphasize that here is because Paul told us to do the same thing. 
In Romans 15, 4, to give just one example, it says, Whatsoever things are written aforetime were written for our learning so that we, through the comfort and patience of the Scriptures, might have hope. And so that's, uh, that's obviously relevant to us today. Continuing, To him which smote great kings and slew famous kings, Sihon the king of Amorites, and Og, the king of Bashan. Let me pause again just to give you something to write about in your notes. There were three kings that are conspicuously defeated. Pharaoh of Egypt, Sihon of the Amorites, and Og, the king of Bashan. These were defeated with Moses in the wilderness wanderings, right? When they enter Canaan, they're going to be confronted to, with seven nations. It fascinated me to notice that there are ten in total, three up front, seven in the land. It's interesting, it may not be relevant, and yet it may be profoundly relevant. You see, to you and I as Western minds, we tend to think of prophecy as, as prediction and fulfillment. They predict something, it happens, that's prophecy. To the Jewish mind, prophecy is pattern. They see patterns in everything God does, and uh, prophetic patterns. Well, it's interesting that we have ten nations, three were put down and seven continue. It's interesting how the Antichrist, at the end time, there's going to be ten, a ten-horned situation, three he puts down, seven, that's why there's seven heads and ten horns in some of the images of Daniel and also Revelation. You wonder if what happened in the land isn't a pre foreshadowing of what's going to happen on a global basis later. I wouldn't make too much of it, but I s submit it for your thoughts. Continuing, and they gave their land for a, it's a speaking of God, and gave their land for a heritage, even a heritage unto Israel his servant. Now, another thing, just as we, as we dwell a little bit, this is in this praise here, we're going through the history of Israel and its relevance. Canaan, when they crossed over to Canaan, Canaan's not heaven. A lot of songs and stuff sort of crossing over Jordan like we're going to heaven. No, you're going into the promised land. That's not the same thing. You're entering into inheritance. That's true. But there are wars in Canaan. There's no wars in heaven. It's not heaven. There's, people can make a mistake there. It just, but it does picture, in a certain sense, our inheritance, Christ, in, inheritance in Jesus Christ in that we need to claim our walk by faith and defeat Satan's attempts to keep us in bondage. But the, the, the time in Canaan was a struggle. It was a time of victory, but a time, a time of challenge. That's not heaven. It's, a, it's anticipatory of that. Let's continue, verse 23. Who remembered us in our low estate... And hath redeemed us from our enemies, who giveth food to all flesh. Oh, give thanks unto the God of heaven. And that's probably the last verse that we need to really claim, very especially. All of us should frequently pause. And be serious about giving thanks to what God has done in each of our lives. For his mercy indeed endureth forever. Okay, that's the antiphonal psalm, Psalm 136. Familiar to us because we will remember the refrain, refrain if we don't remember all the specific issues. But now we're going to move on, which is in a sense is a... a, a well, it certainly is a change of pace. We're going to now have what's technically called an imprecatory psalm, one that calls down retaliation on enemies. Um, and it has the most astonishing last verse of any psalm you can imagine. A psalm that's disturbingly shocking. The last verse will say, I'm giving it to you out of context here, happy shall he be, he that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. 
You've got to be kidding. Is that saying what you think it says? Well, we'll take a look as we go. You know, there are many that will say uh, uh, in a naive sort of way, I believe the Bible from cover to cover. But you discover they're ignorant of what's between those two covers. And this is one of those places that will be disturbing. Let's just get in here. It opens up with a locale, the frame of reference here. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. So this is a song, a hymn, that was composed in reference to the time of the captivity. You may recall, Nebuchadnezzar took the nation into captivity, the Babylonian captivity, 70 years. And uh, if we look at a timeline, after Abraham and all of that, we finally get to Moses and the Exodus. And then uh, after the Exodus, uh, ultimately they all... Uh, come back and settle the land and go through and the monarchy will emerge and, uh, 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 under David and then uh, eventually they uh, will uh, get captured by B Babylon. I want to look a little more closely at the period of time that this, this psalm is really echoing, if you will. And after the monarchy, they go into the Babylonian captivity for 70 years they come out of that, and the period after that is called the post-exile period. And uh, we, we have uh, Haggai and Zechariah as the post-exile prophets, and we have the history of Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and all of that before we get to the New Testament. But it's interesting that the Babylonian captivity itself doesn't have any record of what's going on inside it. We know they were taken slaves, we know when Cyrus conquers Babylon, he frees them, but there's this 70-year time where we have a little insight. And uh, Babylon uh, conquered uh, the region. The first siege of Nebuchadnezzar, he took the captives that included Daniel and his friends. Um, the, the, uh, they were, they were uh, the, the Ezekiel in Babylon and uh, Jeremiah in Jerusalem preach to the people to yield to Nebuchadnezzar. He's the instrument of God. And uh, God is using it as his judgment. And uh, the false prophets convinced the king that, no, they're God's chosen people. We should rebel. And they finally, they did. Nebuchadnezzar puts them down again and changes, puts a different king in charge, subject to him, of course. The second siege takes some more captives. Jeremiah in Jerusalem and Ezekiel in Babylon preach along the lines that the yield to Nebuchadnezzar, if you rebel again, he'll destroy Jerusalem. Right now Jerusalem's run by them. They're enslaved, but they're, they still have their city. Well, again, the false prophets uh, talk them into rebelling again. By the time they do that again, Nebuchadnezzar has had a belly full of the whole operation. He levels the place, takes them all. Uh, slaves. The third siege of Nebuchadnezzar. Important to understand there are three sieges. Many people miss on this. The servitude of the nation begins with the first siege. That's when the nation became captive as a nation. Jerusalem was still subject to them, but uh, in existence. The decree of Cyrus, Cyrus the Persian, conquers Babylon, and uh, Daniel greets him and shows him the letter that God wrote to him 150 years earlier. That's in our book of Isaiah. And uh, He's so impressed because his name, he has his career, his name all mentioned to him, written 150 years early. He's impressed with that. He releases them to go home and gives them financial incentives to go home under the decree of Cyrus. So a group, about 50,000, go home to re go back to Jerusalem to, to rebuild. The it's, it's all in rubbles, but they go to rebuild their temple. The decree of Cyrus starts, the, is in effect, the rule of the Persian Empire as far as Israel is concerned. The desolations of Jerusalem started with the third siege of Nebuchadnezzar. And it isn't until Nehemiah, when they return after Cyrus, under Ezra, they try to rebuild the temple, but they're harassed because of all... They're not in a position to defend themselves. And it's, it's, a, it's a, a meager effort. Until Nehemiah, who is cupbearer to the king Artaxerxes, a successor then to, uh, in, in, uh, in the uh, Greek scheme of things... Um, uh, gives Nehemiah the authority to go rebuild the city, the city walls. And so it's under Nehemiah, uh, he, under his term, they're allowed to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. Now the reason that's so important, the decree of Artaxerxes is the trigger, if you will, to the 
70 weeks of Daniel prophecy. It's very important. It's, it turns out to be very precise, very, very thrilling piece of work. But what's interesting, the servitude of the nation was to be 70 years. The, the desolations of Jerusalem were also predicted to be 70 years, but they're not coterminous. The desolations start later, and they are relieved, but each one is fulfilled to the day prophetically. But the real point I'm getting at, this is just by way of review for most of you, um, is that what really occurred in Babylon during the servitude of the nation isn't recorded. We know there were slaves, but there isn't a lot of visibility. The psalm we're going to see gives us a glimpse of some of that. That's why I'm going through some of this, okay? Second Chronicles carries us up to about the Cyrus, and then Ezra and Nehemiah follow, as I indicated. And of course, the book of Esther occurs probably in about the days of Ezra, uh, in which uh, uh, it's pretty important because if she, she made possible the situation for Nehemiah to follow later. And if, if it hadn't been for her, Jerusalem would not have been rebuilt. There would have been a whole different history. The Hebrew nation would probably have been wiped out some 500 years before Christ was born, and it would have changed the destiny of mankind. So the whole saga of Esther is much deeper than most people have any idea. But uh, Daniel, of course, and Ezekiel are the prophets in the, in the, during the captivity period, and uh, Haggai and Zechariah are known as the post-exile prophets. Could give you just a historical perspective, and Malachi even later. Let's get back to Psalm 137 now. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. You need to understand, they are in slaves. They're, the rivers of Babylon, those are the canals of Babylon. The Euphrates comes down, but the Babylonians had this elaborate canal system that allowed them to, uh, to reap uh, agricultural benefit. How do those canals get built? By slave labor. So you have the Jews there as slaves. And uh, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. They're homesick for what used to be. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. Harps are what they sang with. Were they, were they good at music? What's the history of the Jewish uh, history in music? They are good at it. And they were good at it back then. But they're slaves here. The, the, the psalmist with deep feeling continues. For there they carried us away captive, required of us a song. And they that wasted us, required of us mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? They feel very deeply about, the psalmist here feels very deeply what, what's going on here. And uh, they know, in fact, the Jew today knows what it means to be in a slave labor camp, um, to spend time in forced labor and to have forced entertainment. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth, if I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. This is sort of a pledge of allegiance. It's a, sort of a pledge that, if, 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 that they'll now become obedient to God. They're there in captivity because they sinned. That was God's way of providing judgment on the land, and they knew that, painfully knew that. They had their families abused, their women's right, uh, 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 ravished, their children killed. If I do not, re and, and, and in, in, in all of this, they remember what it was like when they had Jerusalem and Zion. Very, a lot of pain here. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it, even the foundation thereof. Now, this, you need a little background here. Edom was the traditional enemy of Israel. The battle between Edom, uh, Esau and Jacob started in the womb. The tensions you see in the world today under the banner of Islam started in the womb, even before the, the two were born, interestingly enough. Esau, of course, subsequently becomes the enemy of Israel. 
He deliberately marries into the Ishmaelite world, and, and we talked about that previously. When Babylon was conquering Jerusalem, the Edomites sang on the periphery, cheering the Babylonians. Their cheering of the Babylonians during the plight of Israel being conquered by Babylon is recorded in many places. One of them is in Obadiah. The whole book of Obadiah is just a little book, but it's all about Edom and the fact that they cheered when the enemies of Israel succeeded over Israel, and they're going to pay for that. God is, uh, uh, the, the judgment on Edom is coming. Remember, O oh Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem who said, raise it, raise it. If that's in the old English term, raise meaning burn it. Not raise it like build it. No, raise it like destroy it. Raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. That's their family people. These are, these are brethren genealogically cheering for their enemies. In Obadiah, to tear it down, tear it down. We want to be rid of that wicked city is one of the quotes that's in the scripture. And now the people who had survived that deal are now asking for justice. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. So they're looking to a day when Babylon is going to get what they were dishing out. What were they dishing out? That's the last verse of the psalm. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. That's what they did to their captives. There's another way that the Babylonians could limit the future generation of their enemies was to destroy the infants, bash them against rocks, in front of their family, of course. You say, that's terrible. That's awful, isn't it? We do it today. To our own people, not our enemies, in the wombs of the mother. Where's the most dangerous place for an American to be? In the womb, in the, in the womb of his mother. He's got one chance in four of being murdered. For every four births, there's one abortion. The description of the children's being bashed against the stones is in 2 Kings 8, 12, Isaiah 13, 16, Hosea 10, 14, and maybe some other places. It's so shocking, it's disturbing to try to even talk about. And yet... When you think about it, it's probably the least of the abuses that they suffered as captives. Just as all revisited at Dachau, Auschwitz, and the camps during the Nazi regime. And according to Zechariah 13, it's going to happen again, worse than ever before. There is a concept in law... Lex talionis, law of retaliation. And uh, it's eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, as Deuteronomy 19, as one place mentions it. That's a principle in law we even have today. The punishment is intended to fit the crime. Maybe not in the primitive ways described in tribal terms, but certainly, it, and retaliation is not revenge. Retaliation means to pay back in kind in a, in a, in a, legal, in a, in a adjudicated sense. The day is coming when God will wreak his, his vengeance. His vengeance. Vengeance is mine, the Lord says. And, uh, and incidentally, it's a matter of history that Cyrus the Persian, through his general, did exactly that to the Babylonians, what the Babylonians had done to the people of Jerusalem. Remember what Jesus said? Better is a millstone were hanged on his neck than to offend one of these little ones. Or putting another, better than he had not been born than to offend one of the children. No, that, that retaliation is coming because we have a God that is just. 
And we don't want his justice. We want his mercy. There is a uh, comment by Spurgeon that was so eloquent I had to include it. As you read about the... One thing, what makes Psalms so difficult to teach from is that there's so much material. It's really just devotional material that's hard to even summarize fairly. But here's one. I I had to include this quote because people are so shocked by that verse in Psalm 137. Spurgeon says, Let those who find fault with these cures that were not causeless, who never seen their temple burned, their city ruined, their wives ravished, and their children slain. They might not, perhaps, be quite so velvet-mouthed if they had suffered after this fashion. It's one thing to talk of the bitter feeling which moved captive Israelites in Babylon. It's quite another thing to be captives ourselves under a savage and remorseless power which knew not how to show mercy but delighted in the barbarities uh, uh, to the defenseless. The song, speaking of Psalm 137, the song is such as might be fitly sung to, in the Jews' wailing place. It is the fruit of the captivity in Babylon and often has it furnished expression for sorrows which else had been unutterable. It is a gem-like psalm within whose mild radiance there glows a fire which strikes the beholder with wonder. Spurgeon's intensive study on the psalms is unequaled. Well, let's continue. Let's shift to a... This is the first of eight psalms that are attributed to David. And uh, they form a special collection just before the final five hallelujah psalms that climax the book of psalms. So this one's about wholehearted praise. And I will praise thee with my whole heart. That's one of those phrases that's easy to say, but really one that requires seriousness. I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. We've encountered this term before. The word term is used here often of judges, representatives, anything between you and God as a representative, that that term is used. So it's leadership, if you will. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward the holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. That is quite a statement. We know how jealous God is of his name all the way through the scripture. And it's been an interesting exercise to see how often God refers to his name, his authority, his identity. And yet here we have an interesting story. He says, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. That's praise indeed. That's why it shouldn't surprise us that the longest chapter in the Bible, the longest psalm, of course, is Psalm 119, in which it's a highly structured acrostic. 22 Hebrews letter, Hebrews letters used to, to trigger uh, 22 eight stanza quatrains that we looked at a couple of sessions ago. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Here we should probably pause and reread Psalm 119 one more time, but we'll go on. Thy word above all thy name. In the day when I cry, thou answerest me and strengthenest me with strength in my soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise thee, O Lord, when they hear the words of thy mouth. Yea, they shall sing in the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. You know, it's interesting in in, uh, verse 4, Jesus is prince of the kings of the earth. That's a title in Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. He's the one in charge. This says, all the kings of the earth shall praise thee. Remember, in in the climax of Revelation, chapter 19, he's king of kings and lord of lords. There will be universal worship of the living God. But that ain't happening yet, is it? That will happen. They will. And he's going to rule them with a rod of iron. That's all cuts in the millennium, of course. Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly. But the proud he knoweth afar off. You know, it's interesting, after raising our awareness of God to the heights, he quickly points out that he still, despite that, he has respect to the lowly. But those that are proud, he knoweth afar off. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. 
Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. Who's at his right hand? Jesus Christ. How interesting. Okay. And, uh, and this whole idea of being rich, yet being aware of the poor. Uh, 2 Corinthians 8, verses 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Also Philippians chapter 2, first dozen ch verses, known as the kenosis. You might put that in your notes and study it. It, it amplifies this whole thing here. And uh, I'm always reminded of Hal Lindsey's acronym for the book of Romans, the acronym for grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. His right hand shall save me. From here, of course, you can do a whole side study of humility. I couldn't leave it without giving a few things. In Psalm 138, though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect to the lowly, but the proud he knoweth far off. Okay. In Isaiah 57, 15, for thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also, that is, of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite one. See how important humility is in God's every breath. Psalm 131.1, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor mine eyes lofty, neither do I exercise myself in great matters, nor in things too high for me. That was David's plea back in Psalm 131. In James 4.6, he that giveth, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but he giveth grace to who? To the humble, indeed. James 4.10, the next verse, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. 1 Peter 3, 4, let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. And the next verse in, in Peter again, likewise ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud, giveth grace to the humble. There again, echoing the same thoughts there. And the next verse, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Okay, let's move on back to Psalm 138. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever, forsake not the works of thine own hands. This is a prayer. It's analogous to Philippians 1.6 that may be more familiar to your ears. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ, Jesus Christ. What God starts, he finishes. We need to embrace that. So often we get started, we're very encouraged, we, we roll up our sleeves, get at it, and then life happens. There are obstacles, there's delays, there's, we, we wake up to the reality that God's timetable isn't our timetable. And we all face those things. And... Uh, this is, Psalm 138, is sort of an Old Testament way of saying the same thing that, that Paul said to the Philippians in chapter 1, verse 6. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the works of thine own hands. It's, a, it's both a declaration and also a prayer. And by the way, this is underscored in one very important place. Where would that be? The cross. When he yelled to tell us die. It is finished. He endured that you and I might have life forever. Okay, now we come to the big one. <laughs> Psalm 139. It's called by many the greatest and most notable and noble of all the Psalms. If you don't jot down any other, remember 139. 139, because it's going to hit head on the attributes of God. And what are the attributes of God? Well, he's omniscient. What does that mean? Well, God is all-knowing. He knows everything. That's why he can't learn. It's one of the things he can't do. He can't learn, right? He's omnipresent. He's everywhere present. He's everywhere. He, uh, well, what, uh, Paul Davies, a scientist, said, it's as, as if the whole universe is nothing more than a thought in the mind of God. He's everywhere. 
And he's omnipotent. God is all-powerful. All-powerful. Now, what we think about God determines what we think about everything else. What we think about everything else derives from what we think about God. The others, other people, the universe, God's word, God's will, sin, faith, obedience, all these derive from our understanding of who God is. Wrong ideas about God will lead us down the wrong path. So this psalm is going to focus on these three primary attributes of God. Okay, it's to the chief musician, a psalm of David. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassed my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. This speaks to the omniscience of God. He knows everything. He knows me. He is the ultimate psychologist. He knows my thoughts better than I do. And by the way, he's the only one that does. People always ask, there's a big this theological debate, you know, can Satan read or know our thoughts? I don't think so. Except in the sense that a psychologist might. He might draw inferences by our behavior. But only God knows the thoughts and intents of the heart. I, think, I take great comfort in that. That's to, you, know why, you know why that's in the Bible? To keep the personnel departments out of the act, right? Okay. There is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, for it is high, I cannot attain to it. And again, this is, gets at the whole idea that God can't learn. He knows everything about you. You can't be surprised. And uh, now how can God know all that? I don't know. The psalmist doesn't know either. See? I cannot attain to it. And so uh, I won't even try. It's interesting to me to realize that all the, the, the frontier of every field of science is information theory. Physics, the, the, the whole field of particle physics has challenged the very meaning of what information is. The, bio, the microbiologists are discovering the primary threshold of understanding is the theory of information. I think that's fascinating for a lot of reasons. But anyway, the psalmist continues now about omnipresence. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I send up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in Sheol, or hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. Well, they say you can run, but you can't hide. <laughs> no matter where you go, you cannot get away from God. And Jonah tried. It didn't work until God explained it, his assignment a little more clearly to him. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Daniel Webster, American statement and, and uh, orator, a student of Scripture, incidentally, made an impressive use by paraphrasing this for one of his uh, 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 cases. And it's become much quoted. By, uh, you'll recognize that where he, 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 you can recognize in his articulation, he was a man of the cloth, a man of the word. He said, A sense of duty pursues us ever. It is omnipresent like the deity. If we take to ourselves the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, duty performed or duty violated is still with us for our happiness or our misery. If we say, surely the darkness shall cover us in the darkness as the light of our obligations are yet with us, we cannot escape their power nor fly from their presence. Obviously an echo of Psalm, you know, 139. But uh, Daniel Webster, very articulate guy, but obviously drawing on his familiarity with the scriptures. Moving on, verse 13. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. This one gets deeper. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. You know, it is absolutely astonishing to me. The more I discover by reading or periodicals, whatever, about the human body. 
or anything having to do with biology. It's astonishing to discover the complexity and the interdependence of all the parts. They're now discovering, just a recent article in Scientific American, that in the retina of the eye, there's all kinds of visual processing that goes on in the retina, even before it gets sent on. And uh, they're just still begin they're beginning to get glimmers of the incredible complexity of design. What fascinates me, too, is that the opposite of design is randomness. Randomness is defined as the absence of any patterns. No periodicity, no periodicity, no, uh, uh, periodicity, no uh, symmetry, nothing like that. It's the ran that's what randomness means. And it's very difficult to attain, by the way. It takes a lot of effort to get true, true randomness empty of any design. And yet, we live in a culture today that's decided that everything happened by randomness. That's disprovable, and yet that's what we embrace, and that's what our kids are inculcated on in school. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that, <clears throat> and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Whew, what's all that about? The phrase in the Hebrew, the lowest parts of the earth, is a rhetorical device to mean privately, out of sight. That may be all it means. On the other hand, see, it may be a variant to the word secretly earlier um, in the preceding case. But it's also possible that this might be an allusion to some hyperdimensionality that's involved. I've long suspected, I don't have any knowledge here, I've long suspected that even the mind is probably a transfer function to another 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 environment altogether. And uh, the whole hyperspace issue may be hinted at here somewhat. But that's beyond the scope of this study. Let's go on. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, not incomplete. In other words, I was in existence before I was conceived. Before I became substance, even a, 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 a fertilized zygote, whatever. That's physical. Thine eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect. In, 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 unperfect not being with uh, imperfections, but unperfect in sense being incomplete. I hadn't been put together yet. You saw me. And in thy book all my members were written, which were in continuance, were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. In other words, I was designed. I was put in our vernacular. I was in the drawing boards before I was put into production. Uniquely, distinctly. Thine eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Well, this is all, you know, the, the other thing I was going to mention about the biology, uh, uh, really, if you take, if you assume somehow, as we think we understand, that the DNA has all the information to reproduce you, that's what the whole uh, plot line of Jurassic Park was all about. By getting the DNA out of the mosquito, presumably you theoretically could create the whole dinosaur by, you know, by pro processing. Because we're made up of fungible atoms and molecules. The key is the, is, the, is, the the, is the coding to put it together. And that's what the DNA apparently has. Except that leaves a problem. Because the DNA, when you have a first, the first cell, sperm, egg, get together, fertilized zygote, it splits to two. Mitosis take place, it splits. Then the two become four, the four become eight. You know, you've all seen processes in films or in a microscope, whatever. Except something very strange happens. They're identical splits. But then pretty soon, they start specializing. A little dark line that flares, and it turns out later to be a backbone. They start specializing to certain kinds of tissues. Those tissues become certain kinds of organs. Now the problem is, when they first split, the first split that takes place, they're identical splits, right? Let's assume you have the complete blueprint in each library, in each cell. No problem so far. Then they split again. They're identical, right? And they each have the full copy. They, DNA continues. If the DNA continues, let me give you the analogy. Let's assume every one of you in this room had the skill to play any musical instrument. You could play many of them, and there's plenty of them around. And let's assume I gave each one of you a complete copy of the symphony. Would we have a symphony? 
No, because there's an issue in computer design called conflict resolution logic. Somewhere, somebody has to decide, you're going to be first violin, you're going to be percussion, you're going to be string, you know, whatever. Not only to make the assignments and allow you to specialize, but also to bring it together into a harmonious whole. That requires external information. Just giving a complete description of the symphony to each cell doesn't give you a symphony. From an information science point of view, it requires external input to make it happen. Follow me? That implies that God is involved in some way in every cell division. Staggering. Thine eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect that in thy book all my members were written which were in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. How precious are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, there are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Two key facts. God loves us and he's all powerful. What a combination of thoughts. That God is all powerful. There's nothing he can't do. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. God loves us. And the God who loves us is all powerful. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. He's talking to God. They speak against thee, God, wickedly. And thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? Am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. The word perfect there is also complete. Not perfect because it's not free of imperfections. It's, we use the term perfect a little differently. Here it just means complete. Complete hatred. I count them mine enemies. See, both the wicked and the godly are mentioned in the Psalms. And these few verses are why this psalm happens to be categorized as an imprecatory psalm. It's a strange label for a psalm that really is aimed so highly. The imprecatory psalms, remember they were the enemies, the enemies is talking about were rebels against God, not just against David personally or something. And the imprecatory psalms are, uh, the, the covenant people were protected under conditions of obedience. If they were obedient, they were protected by God, and they were entitled to the imprecatory psalms. And that's listed in a number of places. And the battle of good and evil has been going on since Genesis 3. There's nothing new here, and that's part of what this is all about. Satan is not through. And we can't remain neutral in this battle. And Psalm 139, 140 are imprecatory psalms that are on the table in front of us, this one and the one following. Psalm 139 continues, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there's any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. That should be our prayer. It takes confidence to pray that prayer. You need to know God loves you in order to pray that prayer. Okay, God, search me. You will judge the wicked. And pray, pray that God is all-knowing, all-powerful, and it's everywhere. Okay, Psalm 140 is going to focus, is going to pick up this theme and focus specifically on evil leadership. And uh, David, it would seem, in writing this, was surrounded by evil men, people that were slandering him. King Saul had ordered his officers to, get, to kill David. He is a fugitive. And uh, evil men were plotting against him continually. This psalm also, though, is a prophecy of the last days when a godly remnant of Israel will face the Antichrist, the false Messiah, that man of sin. And the psalm also has an application. There's sort of three levels here. David's a historical one, a eschatological or prophetic one, and then an application for you and I. Each one of us can pray this prayer as we go through, look through Psalm 140. To the chief musician of Psalm of David, deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Preserve me from the violent man, which imagine mischiefs in their heart continually are they gathered together for war. 
These are uh, uh, John in his, uh, uh, the Apostle John in his, first, in his first epistle points out that there are now many Antichrists. As you heard Antichrist shall come, there are many Antichrists. Remember that in, in, in the second chapter of, of First John. They gather together for war. They have sh- sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Adder's poison is under their lips. And then we have Selah, that word that says, think about that. Stop, a thought connector. Romans, Paul in Romans picks up that term in Romans chapter 3. As it's written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Just a quote from that psalm. Same flavor, same same issue. The danger of wicked leadership. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Boy, does that characterize our culture today. There are more murders in Washington for political reasons than we dare list. Over the last decade or so, over a hundred. Swift to shed blood. There's no fear of God before their eyes. There have been people misinformed. There have been people who slipped here and there, but intended well. No, this is not that anymore. There is no fear of God at all here. Moving on to Psalm 140, verse 4. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from the violent man who have purposed to overthrow my goings. The proud have hid a snare for me. The cords, they have spread a net by the wayside. They have set gins for me. Selah, again. And uh, David's prayer, it's pretty vis- easy to visualize David in this situation because he was a fugitive for probably a decade from Psalm, uh, from uh, uh, Saul and uh, wrote many psalms that echo that, of course. And they spread a net. The word gins is really a, a, uh, um, a, a senior moment, a uh, hoop, a hoop for capturing a small animal. And thus it becomes a trap or a snare. And, uh, but... Uh, uh, Dear beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. This again out of Romans. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So we've got four lessons here in this psalm. The first five verses that we've gone through, what sinners do to God's people. The next one is what God's people should do to sinners. And we've got a taste of that here in verses 6 through 8. And uh, I said unto the Lord, Thou art my God. Hear the voice of my supplications, O Lord. O God the Lord, the strength of my salvation. Thou hast covered my head in the day of battle. Grant not, O Lord, the desires of the wicked. Further not his wicked device, lest they exalt themselves. Again, Selah. Uh, uh, that pause. Boy, think of that. The third lesson is what does sin do to sinners? We've seen what sinners do to God's people, what God's people should do to sinners. Now what does sin do to sinners? That's the next couple of verses here. As for the head of those that compass me about, let the mischief of their own lips cover them. Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire into deep pits that they rise up not again. Let not an evil speaker be established in the earth. Evil shall hunt the violent man to overthrow him. And then the final thing is, okay, what does God do for his people? I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and the right of the poor. Surely the righteous shall give thanks unto thy name. The upright shall dwell in thy presence. Okay, a couple more and we'll wrap it up here. Psalm 141. This is again a a, a close cousin. This is deliverance from evil. Again from David. Lord, I cry unto thee. Make haste unto me. Give ear unto my voice when I cry unto thee. Let my prayer be set forth before thee as an incense. And the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth, keep the door of my lips. Interesting way of putting it. He's saying, don't let my lips and my life contradict each other. That's basically what he's saying. I incline not my heart to any evil thing to practice wicked works with men that work iniquity. And let me not eat of their dainties. 
Let the righteous smite me, it shall be a kindness. Let him reprove me, it shall be an excellent oil, which shall not break my head, for yet my prayer also shall be in their calamities. What he's really saying here is do, avoid compromise. We be working in the world, but we should not be of the world. Or as one writer put it, the boat should be in the ocean, but it's tragic when the ocean gets in the boat. Okay, <laughs> it's along the same idea. And, and as far as uh, uh, this issue is concerned, it's not how do we get out of this, but rather how do, what do we get out of this? When we're in trouble, it's not the question of just getting out of the trouble. The other thing is what do we get out of the trouble? Why, what, why did God bring that? What are the lessons? Our prayer should be let the lessons not be wasted. When their judges are overthrown in stony places, they shall hear my words, for they are sweet. My, our bones are scattered at the grave's mouth, and one cutteth and cleaveth wood upon the earth. But mine eyes are unto thee, O God the Lord. In thee is my trust, leave not my soul destitute. And don't take, off, don't take your eyes off the Lord. Remember Peter when he's walking on water there in uh, uh, Matthew 14. He was doing fine until he took his eyes off the Lord and he started to sink. And that, that little object lesson I think is true of our lives as we face uh, crises of different kinds, whether it's people plotting against us or whether it's just some form of impatience. Let's not take our eyes off the Lord. Don't compromise. Keep me from the snares which they have laid for me for the jinns of the workers of the Jinns, again, is a, a, a mokesh. It's a term meaning a, a, like a noose for catching small animals or a hook for the nose. It means to be ensnared the way it's being used here. Let the wicked fall into their own nets whilst that I withal escape. Oh, here we go. I thought I, knew, I, thought I had a footnote here. Good. Yeah, there's mokesh. Um, a noose for catching animals, a hook and so forth. Okay. Okay, the cave song. This is one written in the cave. In fact, it says so. That's Mashil, which means it's an instructionary thing. In fact, it's a model prayer. The, the disciples asked Jesus, teach us to pray. Well, this is this equivalent kind of response where David's teaching us to pray, in effect. A prayer, uh, he was in a cave, but it's really an instructionary song. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed him before uh, him my trouble. There's a piece that was written in the 17th century I had to throw in here about telling God. I thought, that, since we're talking about prayer here, focusing on prayer, this is, I think, useful. Tell God all that is in your heart as one unloads one hearts, its pleasures and its pains as if to a dear friend. Tell him your troubles that he may comfort you. Tell him your joys that he may, he may uh, sober them. Tell him your longings that he may purify them. Tell him your dislikes that he may help you to conquer them. Talk to him of your temptations that he may shield you from them. Show him the wounds of your heart that he may heal them. Lay bare your indifference to, to good, your depraved tastes for evil, your instability. Tell him how self-love makes you unjust to others, how vanity tempts you to be insincere, how pride disguises you to yourself as to others. If you thus pour out all your weaknesses, needs, and troubles, there will be no lack of what to say. <laughs> you will never exhaust the subject. It is continually being renewed. <laughs> People who have no secrets from each other never want subjects of conversation. They do not weigh their words, for there is nothing to be held back. Neither do they seek for something to say. They talk out of the abundance of the heart, without consideration, just what they think. What great advice. You know, we tend to be so formal with prayer, so guarded. How silly. God knows it all. What joy there is is being open and candid with Him. Tell me what you really think. Blessed are they who attain to such familiar and unreserved intercourse with God. This is one writer known as Fenelon in, in, uh, in the end of the 17th century, early part of the 18th. Uh, yeah, 18th. French writer. He, uh, his writings became the basis of profound changes, both politically and culturally in France. Anyway. Continuing Psalm 142. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knowest my path in the way wherein I walked have they privily laid a snare for me. I looked at my right hand and beheld that there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. 
I cried unto thee, O Lord. I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison that I may praise thy name. The, the righteous shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. And this was, of course, this is where David, we don't know whether he was writing this in En Gedi, the cave there, or the cave of Adullam. He was several times in a cave. He couldn't be written either one. But um, when he first left the court of Saul, he really felt alone. And he, and he wrote this, this and some similar prayers. And uh, 400 men ended up joining him. And he knew that God was responsible for that show of support. And all those lessons of those fugitive years serve him in the subsequent uh, 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 later life as he reigned in Hebron and then in Jerusalem later. Okay, a couple more and we're through. Psalm 103, an urgent appeal. Psalm of David again. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplications. In thy faithfulness answer me and in thy righteousness. And enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. Indeed. That, remember the Christian's bar of soap. When you hear these kinds of things, you want to remember 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, we are, he, is faith, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Praise indeed. Praise his name indeed. For the enemy hath persecuted my soul. He hath smitten my life down to the ground. He hath made me to dwell in darkness as those that have been long dead. Therefore is my spirit overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is desolate. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all thy works. I muse on the work of thy hands. I stretch forth my hands unto thee. My soul thirsteth after thee as a thirsty land. Selah. Hear me speedily, O Lord, my spirit faileth. Hide not thy face from me, lest I be like unto them that go down into the pit. Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning. For in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto thee. Deliver me, O Lord, from mine enemies. I flee unto thee to hide me. Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of the uprightness. Quicken me, O Lord, for thy name's sake. For thy righteousness' sake, bring my soul out of trouble. Thy righteousness' sake. Somebody asked once, a person one time, if you could lose the salvation, he says, if I can lose my salvation, God loses more than I do. Really? Because all I can lose is my salvation. He loses his good word, his righteousness. My salvation depends on his righteousness because of John 10. Jesus gave him the responsibility in, in, in John 17 in the prayer. Anyway, quicken me, Lord, for thy name's sake, for thy righteousness' sake, bring my soul out of trouble. And of thy mercy cut off mine enemies and destroy all them that afflict my soul, for I am thy servant. And Israel today, this fits, Micah 7, 20, thou wilt perform the truth to Jacob, the mercy to Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto the fathers from the days of old. The same prayer that we're praying individually, Israel can pray corporately to God. And that, that's what Micah 7 is talking about. Exodus 2, and God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob. God looked upon the children of Israel and God had respect unto them. So they can claim a, a specific commitment. And so these Psalms have special meaning there. And the Gentiles, for they, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And I hope that's not us. So these, there are penitential Psalms. And some of them have been categorized by the church. There's seven of them. Against the wrath, uh, 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 I've got Psalm 8. Against pride, Psalm 32. Against gluttony, Psalm 38. Against impurity, Psalm 51. Against covetousness, Psalm 102. Against envy, in Psalm 130. And against carelessness, in Psalm 143. So here we have seven psalms. The early church called these special psalms and uh, set them aside for use on Ash Wednesday and other certain Places. So these psalms can be viewed as focusing on those specific uh, sins, if you will. Okay, psalm, well, this is the last then for tonight. Psalm 144, our ultimate defense. Blessed be the Lord, my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. Now that surprises Christians. I thought we weren't supposed to fight. Now, Jesus said, when a, strong man, uh, when a strong man armed keepeth his house or his palace, his goods are in peace. That's in Luke 11. We have an obligation to protect our loved ones. 
there's a mad dog coming down the street and your children are playing out in front, you're going to do something about it. And if necessary, you'll shoot the dog. Whatever. No, there are legitimate causes for war. The day will come that a man will sell his coat to get a sword, Jesus told him in Gethsemane. So, My goodness and my fortress, my high tower, my deliverer, my shield. Wow, there's a list. My goodness, my fortress, my high tower, my deliverer, my shield. And he in whom I trust who subdueth my people under me. Lord, what is man that thou takest knowledge of him? Or the son of man that thou shouldest make account of him? Man is like to vanity. His days are as a shadow that passeth away. Now, in verse 4, you'll find on sundials all over the world, the very popular thing to put on a sundial, that uh, our days are like a shadow that passeth away indeed. And, of course, the whole broader thought here is that life is purposeless without God. You know, we teach the kids that we're, they're subject to a cosmic accident, and then we wonder why they have no sense of destiny or no sense of heritage. Duh. All right. Bow thy heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains, and they shall smoke. Cast forth lightning and scatter them. Shoot out thine arrows and destroy them. Send thine hand from above. Rid me and deliver me out of great waters from the hand of strange children whose mouth speaketh vanity, and their right hand is a right hand of falsehood. This is a call for God to intrude in human history. And, and Isaiah says much the same thing in chapter 64. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence, and as, w- as when the melting fire burneth, the fire causes the waters to boil and make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. And boy, they will. When thou didst terrible things which we looked not for, thou camest down, the mountains flowed down at thy presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for them that waiteth for him. Well, getting back to that was Isaiah. Getting back to Psalm 144, I will sing a new song unto thee, O God, upon the psaltery and on an instrument of ten strings will I sing praises unto thee. I'm really fascinated. I always find ten strings. And I'm intrigued that the the particle physicists now have decided that we live in 10 dimensions, that uh, they're in 10 dimensions, we have, you know, one-dimensional strings vibrating or whatever. Uh, Anyway, um, there may be something more here, maybe not. It is he that giveth salvation unto kings who delivereth David his servant from the hurtful sword. Rid me... And deliver me from the hand of strange children whose mouth speaketh vanity, and their right hand is a right hand of falsehood. That our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth, that our daughters may be as cornerstones polished after the similitude of a palace, that our garners may be full, affording all manner of store, that our sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our streets that our oxen may be strong to labor, that there may be no breaking in or going out, that there be no complaining in our streets. <laughs> happy is that people that is such the case. Yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Okay. We are now ready for the final. From Psalm, there's six left. Psalm 105 to 150, they are the, the Hallelujah Psalms. And in addition to reviewing those for next time, I also encourage you to review all your notes on the entire series. And I'll try to go through and highlight the main things that we want to glean from this, in an expositional sense at least. Um, But again, I want to emphasize this is not the kind of thing where you learn facts like history or narratives. This is one that you need to immerse in and seek devotionally. It's a, it should be a gateway to God's presence. And you'll only achieve that in your private time with seriousness of purpose. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the joy and treasure of your psalms, these hymns that you've provided us. We do recognize that they're written for our learning, that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you and our Lord Jesus. We thank you, Father, for this time together. We thank you, Father, for the opportunities you put before us. We pray you'd help us to be ever more effective stewards of the opportunities before us 
And those opportunities include our free time to spend time in privacy with you devotionally as we do commit ourselves into your hands. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.